Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the second astronomy public tour of the season. Tonight, we'll be talking about discovering planets outside our own solar system. And this has become somewhat routine. Uh, you know, a month doesn't go by where we don't hear of another extra, uh, extrasolar planet discovery. Traditionally, these discoveries have been of very large Jupiter-sized and mass planets very close to their parent stars. But due to the advances of technology and uh, basically heroic observing uh, attempts by astronomers, we've begun to discover Earth-like planets in orbits much closer to that of Earth's and our suns. And uh, to talk about these distant Earths and how we find them, uh, we present tonight Ari Silbert, who's a graduate student here at the department. He did his undergrad at Mount Allison University, and his current <laughs> thesis topic is three-dimensional simulations of habitable Earth-like planets. Uh, take it away, Ari. Thank you. Tonight I'm going to be here talking to you about life in the universe. Specifically, I'm going to be talking to you about what have we learned up today about planets outside of our solar system and what are our current prospects for looking for and searching for life in our universe. So, as most of you probably know, we live in the Milky Way galaxy, which is home to over 200 billion stars. And so that's an incredibly large number much larger than any of us can really comprehend. But unfortunately, these are the types of numbers that astronomers have to deal with on a daily basis. So if we were to suppose that even 1% of these systems housed planets, if 1% of these stars housed planets, that would represent 2 billion planets in our galaxy alone. Now, this is an incredibly large number. And if we are on our quest for life, to search for life in the universe, then this seems like a needle in the haystack problem. You know, we have to look individually at each planet to see if there's life here. You know, is there anything else we can do to help you know, narrow down our search? And so scientists have come up with a set of criteria to select for planets that are more likely to house life than others. Planets meeting these criteria we call habitable planets. And they are composed of two main criteria. So the first main criteria is that these planets are orbit in the habitable zone of their star. And so here, as we zoom out to the top-down view of our solar system, uh, I will show you what exactly this means. Essentially, what the habitable zone describes is a region around every star where liquid water is believed to exist. Not necessarily that the planet itself has liquid water, but it's the temperature range where if, liquid, where if water is, uh, is present, it will be in liquid form. Scientists believe that water, liquid water, is an integral part of life. And as a result, this is one of the primary foundations of our definition of habitable planet. The second most important, the second factor or component in this definition is we require that these planets are Earth-sized. And so why is it important that it must be Earth-sized? It turns out if a planet is much smaller than Earth, let's say Mars-sized, it turns out that it's physically too light to retain the important chemicals uh, important for life. So for instance, if we're looking at the main constituents of each planet's atmosphere, we see that Mars, for instance, its main constituents are carbon dioxide and argon. And these have chemical weights of 40 grams per mole. If we now compare this to Earth, we see that the main constituents of Earth's atmosphere are lighter. They're 28 and 32 grams per mole. We don't necessarily mean that Mars never had nitrogen or oxygen, we're not sure. But even if it started off having nitrogen and oxygen, then over time, because this these light planets are physically too light to hold on to these lighter compounds, then over time, these molecules have dissipated. And as a result, it's very unlikely that a small planet would have the atmosphere conducive for life. Similarly, it, or opposingly, if we go to a very large planet, it turns out that we end up with um, temperatures and pressures that are also non-conducive for life. So in the case of Jupiter, Jupiter is a very large planet. And in the interior, they have pressures about a million times that of Earth and temperatures about, of about 10,000 degrees Celsius. Both of these are very unlikely uh, properties to house life. So as a result, we now have our two main definitions, the habitable zone and Earth size. This is our definition of a habitable planet. But there are a few disclaimers that I'd just like to point out. The first is that of the atmosphere. The atmosphere is not in our current definition, but it is a very strong factor of whether or not life can exist on a planet. 
For instance, in the case of Earth, if we were to suddenly remove Earth's atmosphere, the average temperature would suddenly drop to about minus 15 degrees, where our current average temperature is about 15 degrees. On the other end of the spectrum, if we suddenly gave Venus an, uh, or sorry, if we suddenly gave Earth a Venus-sized atmosphere, a slightly thicker, then the temperature would be about 400 degrees, or about the temperature of your oven, which is also very non-conducive to life, or it's hotter than any of us would be willing to deal with. So the atmosphere is a big variable, and it's cu currently something we know little about for Earth-like systems, but it is nonetheless very important for life. The second disclaimer I'd like to talk about is that of liquid water. So if a planet is orbiting the habitable zone, it is guaranteed that it should house liquid water, but it doesn't necessarily mean that if it's not in the habitable zone that it can't house liquid water. So in the case of Europa and Titan, two moons, Europa is a moon of Jupiter and Titan is a moon of Saturn. Both of these have liquid water and yet they're nowhere near the habitable zone. Why is this? It turns out that due to tidal friction, essentially as these moons orbit around Jupiter and Saturn, there are these tidal forces that are induced which cause heat in the interior of these moons and cause liquid water as a result to occur. And so even if these planets or these moons are not necessarily in the habitable zone, there still could be liquid water for other reasons. All you essentially need is a heat source. And furthermore, um, Europa is among the strongest candidates for life in our own solar system, excluding Earth. And as a result, another point to make is that even if a planet is not in the habitable zone or Earth's size, for instance in the case of Jupiter, even if itself is not habitable, it could house a habitable moon such as Europa. The third point that I'd like to point out is that we are looking for life like us. <laughs> for instance, you know, there could be floating brains somewhere in the universe, but because we have no idea how such a form would exist or how it would survive, from now we are only restricting our definition for life like us. Not necessarily that it looks like us, but that is dependent upon the properties that are present here on Earth. So, before I get into the science of planet detection, I would first like to give you just a brief overview. So in 1992, the first pair of planets were detected uh, around a pulsar. And this is incredible for two reasons. First, of course, that it was our first successful detection outside of the solar system. And second, that these planets were observed around a pulsar, which is essentially a dead star that has undergone a huge supernova explosion. And it was unfathomed that you could have surviving planets around such a dead star. So this was an incredible discovery. Then in 1995, the first planet was discovered around a typical star. Uh, and then between 1995 and 2009, steadily we found more and more planets through various missions. And in 2009, we probably knew of uh, 100, maybe 200 planets. Also in 2009, the Kepler Space Telescope was launched, which has been a hugely successful mission for detecting planets outside of our solar system. To date, we know of over 4,500 planets, and over 85% of those have been found through the Kepler Space Telescope. So, what is the Kepler Space Telescope? So it turns out that it, it is a space-based telescope. It's orbiting in space, and it was named after the famous Johannes Kepler, which is a great scientist of his day. It turns out that, it, so it was launched in 2009. Uh, in 2012, it was originally a four-year mission, but in 2012, it was so successful that it was, its mission was extended. But unfortunately, in 2013, uh, a reaction wheel broke, which essentially means that it can't really align itself to the field of view anymore. And so the current prospects of the future of Kepler is uncertain. But currently the Kepler Space Telescope, or when it was in operation, it was staring at a single patch of sky near the constellation Cygnus. And the size of it was about two scoops the size of the Big Dipper. So if you're ever looking at night and you see the Big Dipper, then it, when, if you think of the spoon part of the Big Dipper, just two times the size of that is essentially the field of view that Kepler has been looking at. And so, the, it's found over 4,000 planets to date, and it's been an extremely successful mission, especially relative to the cost. So if I were, were to compare the Kepler mission to other things that we kind of know about, for instance, if, if you were to put a man on the moon today, and you had to start from scratch, and you had to build the rocket, and you had to train the personnel, et cetera, et cetera, it would take about $150 billion. Similarly, the space station, the International Space Station, also costs about $150 billion, rough estimates. Uh, the current U.S. Uh, military budget annual is about a trillion dollars. <laughs> and so if we were to compare this to the Kepler Space Telescope, 
it comes in at a whopping $600 million. <coughs> so, and not to mention that this is over four years, so the annual cost of the Kepler Space Telescope was about 150 million years. So it's been an incredibly cheap and an incredible, su incredibly successful mission. So, how do we actually find planets? There are many methods and there are many different ways to detect planets. There's astrometry, there's direct imaging, there's radial velocity, but because the Kepler Space Telescope is responsible for over 85% of the planets detected, if there's one method that you're going to be familiar with, then it's this one. So, how does Kepler work? So let's suppose right now that we are alien astronomers and we are looking at our own solar system. What would we see? Well, first and foremost, we would detect a constant amount of brightness from the sun over time. We as humans here can attest to this fact because year after year, day after day, we have relatively predictable seasons, predictable temperatures. If on the one hand, you know, if one day the sun was giving off a lot of energy and then a very little bit, it would be reflected uh, on Earth where one day it would be, you know, plus 50 degrees and the next day it would be minus 50 degrees and we'd have very fluctuating temperatures. So the sun is giving off a very constant amount of brightness over time. And so, if we were alien astronomers observing this system, all of a sudden, if a body passed in front of the star, we would notice a decrease in brightness. As we all know here on Earth, the Earth itself is not luminous, and therefore, as it passes in front of the sun, it would block some of that light which we would normally see, and as a result, there would be a decrease in brightness. This wouldn't be conclusive yet. We would, all we'd be able to tell is that something happened, something passed in front of the sun. If, however, as alien astronomers, we kept viewing the sun and 365 days later, we observed the same transit and the same decrease in brightness, we'd be able to conclude that there was a planet there. Now, there's one important disclaimer that I should mention about the transit method, and that's that it requires a very specific orientation to detect planets. If I now just slightly change the alignment of this system, and here we are again, Earth is passing in front of the sun. You, or, or sorry, you can see that Earth does not pass in front of the sun anymore. If I just change the system, the angle slightly, then suddenly there's no transit. And if we were alien astronomers and viewing this system, no matter how long we viewed it for, we would not observe a transit. And so there are many planets that are out there orbiting stars that we do not detect because it doesn't transit. But because in general, systems are very randomly aligned with respect to Earth, we can account for these missing systems because there's no preference for systems that are aligned. Long story short, there are missing planets, but we can account for them. So, now we know that how Kepler detects planets. How does it detect habitable planets? This is what we're after. How do we find life? So, it turns out that we can use two simple equations which will tell us whether or not a planet is Earth-sized and whether or not it orbits in the habitable zone. So, the first equation I'd like to draw your attention to in the top left is the brightness equation. And essentially what this is telling us is that the size of the planet is proportional to the decrease in brightness. So we can, if you kind of imagine two extremes, it can maybe give you a better perspective. So let's suddenly imagine that it wasn't the Earth transiting in front of the sun, but it was a little tiny speck of dust. Then you'd imagine that it wouldn't block out much light and there wouldn't be much of a decrease in brightness. It's just a little tiny speck. On the other end of the extreme, let's now imagine that's a huge Jupiter-sized planet. You can imagine that it would block more light and it would be easier to detect and it would be more significant of a decrease. So as a result, just by simply detecting the decrease in brightness, we can determine how large that planet is, or in other words, if it's Earth-sized or not. Now, to draw your attention to Kepler's third law, which is what the Kepler Space Telescope is named after, that famous scientist, Johannes Kepler. Kepler's third law essentially tells us that the period of the planet, or the year of the planet, is proportional to the distance from the sun. So, for instance, in the case of Earth, Earth's orbital period, or its year, is 365 days. If we suddenly changed Earth's year to, let's say, 200 days, by the laws of physics, it would have to therefore be closer to the sun than it currently is. Or, if we, moved, if we changed Earth's period to 400 days or 500 days, it would have to be farther away. We can uh, see this with our own solar system. On the y-axis, we have orbital period or years, and on the x-axis, we have distance from the sun. As you can see, as the year increases, then the distance from the sun also increases as well. We would never be able to see a planet that would have a shorter year than Earth, but was farther away than Earth. These are, these are very related quantities. So as a result, simply, if we determine how long it takes for a planet to transit, 
and then come around again and transit again, if we time that, p that amount, of, if we see how much time has elapsed, we can determine how far away it is or if it's in the habitable zone. So as a result, using Kepler, we can determine if it's Earth size in the habitable zone, which is our basic criteria for whether or not a planet is habitable or likely to contain life. So what has Kepler found? What are some of the more notable results that Kepler has discovered to date? Well, first and foremost, I'd like to tell you guys that Kepler has actually found aliens. It's true. There's been a huge conspiracy theory covering up the true results of the Kepler Space Telescope. I'm just kidding. There's no, there's been no aliens. I'm sorry. There's been no aliens detected by NASA in the Kepler Space Telescope. But that doesn't mean that we haven't detected or discovered some very interesting results that can tell us more about whether or not life can exist out there. Earlier this year, in, in 2013, a paper released by Fressen et al. from the Harvard-Smithsonian Institute for Astrophysics released a paper saying that 17% of stars house Earth-sized planets. Let me say that again. 17% of stars house Earth-sized planets. At the beginning of my talk, I supposed that if even 1% of stars housed planets, then that would mean 2 billion planets out there, which is a huge statistic to try and sift through. Now, we are learning that 17% of stars house Earth-sized planets. That is a much more, that's a much stronger statistic, and that means that there are 34 billion planets that are Earth-sized in our galaxy alone, let alone other galaxies. Not to mention, if we extend this statistic to just include all planets, then this statistic rises to 70%. 70% of all stars out there house a planet of some kind. And as I talked about earlier also, just because a planet is not Earth-sized doesn't necessarily mean that it's not habitable in its own way. For the case of Jupiter again, even though it's, it itself is not habitable, it could house a moon which could have liquid water and could be habitable in its own way. A again, as I said before, Europa is among the prime candidates excluding Earth where life could exist. And there are missions that have been proposed to actually go to Europa. In our lifetime, there will be some missions that will go to Europa and see whether or not there's life there. But the story gets better. The story gets even better. As of two weeks ago, like extremely recently, there's been another paper released by Pettigura and collaborators from the University of California, Berkeley, which states that 11% of sun-like stars harbor an Earth-like planet in the habitable zone. So before we had a statistic that was saying that 17% of stars house Earth-sized planets, but not necessarily in the habitable zone. Now we are essentially seeing that if you just pick a star, just any star in the sky, there's a 10% chance that it houses an Earth-sized planet in the habitable zone, or a habitable planet. This is an incredible statistic because this suggests that at least the basic raw conditions that are important for life is extremely, extremely common everywhere in the universe. So, with this, I would like to take you through a small sample of specific cases of habitable worlds that we've found to date. So the first planet that I'd like to introduce to you is Gliese 581g. It turns out that this planet has been somewhat disputed over the years, but the current status is that it is in fact a planet. So the first thing I'd like to draw your attention to is the fact that this Gliese 581 system in general is very, very close to its star. If we compare this to our own sun and our own solar system, you can see all these planets are closer to its own star than Mercury is to our sun. And so you might be thinking, well, how is this possible that there's a habitable planet here when all these planets are closer than Mercury is to our own sun, and yet Earth is in the habitable zone, which is farther than Mercury? It turns out that because of the star's size, Temperature is very related to a star's size. And so because Gliese 581g, or sorry, because Gliese 581, the star, is much cooler and much, er, is much smaller, then as a result, it's much cooler. And as a result, everything gets pushed in, so the habitable zone is much closer. And so even though Gliese 581g is in the habitable zone of its star, its period, or its year, is only 36 days, which is essentially a month by Earth standards. I mean, imagine getting to celebrate Christmas and your birthday every month. That'd just be incredible. That'd be, I'm all for it. So the reason why this is particularly a very captivating system is because it's so close to us. 
The GLEES 581 system is the closest habitable system to our sun uh, at 20 light years away. And so what, is what does 20 light years mean? That's like astronomy talk. Like, what does that mean? So the closest sun to us, the closest star to us, Alpha Centauri, is four light years away. And the entire radius, or the entire diameter, sorry, of the galaxy is 100,000 light years. So when you put that in perspective, 20 light years is just a couple houses down the street. It's extremely close to us. And as a result, it's so, it's so exciting that uh, there could be habitable systems just right next door. The next system I'd like to draw your attention to is the Kepler-22 system. This system is also relatively close. It's 500 light years away, which again, when compared to the 100,000 light year diameter of the Milky Way, this is still in our neighborhood. And so, the Kepler-22b planet is about two and a half times the size of Earth. And so, one question you might be thinking is, so you demanded that habitable planets must be Earth-sized, but when is it, what's the boundary? When does it not become Earth-sized anymore? The current limit of how big a planet can be before it's not Earth-sized is about three times, three and a half times. So two and a half times is well within the limit. Um, but once you get to around three times the size, or three and a half, it's uncertain whether or not it's simply a small version of Jupiter and very gaseous, or simply a large version of Earth and still very rocky, but just amplified. So, the, thing, the reason why Kepler-22b is so exciting is because the system is very much like our own solar system. Even though there's only one planet that we know of so far in the system, it orbits a star exactly like our own sun. And so, if you simply were to take Kepler-22b and pluck it from that system and put it in our own system, it would sit very comfortably between Earth and Venus. It'd be nice to have like another brother and sister around, you know, it'd be, it'd be great. So. Now that I've taken you through a small sample of the habitable planets, specific habitable planets, what's the next step? As you may have realized as I've been going through the basic characteristics, all we really know about these systems is that they are Earth-sized and that they're in the habitable zone. But what about some more specific properties? I mean, as I've, as I've already talked about, you know, we don't know anything about their atmospheres. We don't know if it has lakes and streams. We don't know what its composition is. Sometimes we can get a, a rough estimate of its bulk de density, but we really don't know too much about these systems. Again, if we were alien astronomers and we were looking at our own solar system using our criteria of a habitable planet, they might not consider Mars a habitable planet just because it's slightly too small, but Venus would certainly be a habitable planet by our standards, and yet, as us humans know, Venus is very inhospitable. So what's the next step? Could we potentially visit? <laughs> so let's suppose that we were going to take a trip to Gliese 581G. <coughs> How long would it take to get there? Would it take a year, 10 years, 40 years? One girl shaking her head. <laughs> Turns out it would take about 350,000 years, <laughs> which is a lot longer than I'm personally willing to wait. So it seems like visiting is not the answer because Gliese 581G is the closest system to us and it would take way too long. Not to mention if you get there and there's nothing there, that'd be kind of a wasted trip. <laughs> so what about potentially communication? What you see here is the light sphere radius of Earth. So what is that? It turns out since the 1940s, since the popularization of radio, every time a radio signal is sent, a portion of that radio signal leaks out into space. And these radio signals have been traveling at the speed of light in all directions since they've been transmitted, first transmitted. And as a result, any star that is inside this sphere would have heard these signals if they were listening. So in the case of Gliese 581G, for instance, if there is life on these systems, then they would have heard our radio signals from the past already by now. And they would be able to determine that there's life on Earth, or at least that there's something sending these signals, which probably the only explanation I could come up with is that there was life. But, so this, th this communication seems to work for Gliese 581G, because if we send a signal there, it's 20 years. Another signal to respond, it's another 20 years. 40 years total, it's not ideal, but it's not the worst thing, you know, if it means we could communicate with aliens. But it seems that this example only goes so far. For instance, if we were going to send a signal to Kepler-22, then this would take 500 years to get there, 500 years to get back, 
And again, you know, we might be waiting a thousand years, hoping for a signal, and nothing might ever show up. Not to mention, even if there was life there, perhaps the signal gets lost along the way, or maybe they weren't listening at the right time and they missed the signal. It seems like there are too many variables that it seems like it's also not really a good alternative. All right, so enough, of, enough chit chat. What's the real next step? Turns out that the real next step is investigating exoplanet atmospheres. And so why is this so important? Why is atmospheres the next step? So in addition to the fact that if we could detect exoplanet atmospheres, it would reveal a wealth of information as far as the composition of these atmospheres, et cetera, which is also representative of the chemicals on Earth or of the planet itself. It turns out that there are also a few biomarkers which are very, very important uh, for life on Earth. So for instance, the presence of, uh, on Earth, the presence of oxygen and ozone is very, very strongly coupled to life here on Earth. If, Earth were, er, if life on Earth were suddenly to disappear tomorrow, then within the next couple hundred years, all the oxygen and all the ozone in our atmosphere would disappear. And when you put that on the time scale of life has been here for about four billion years, give or take, then that's an incredibly short light, uh, time scale for oxygen and ozone to disappear. So if we were to ever detect ozone and oxygen in the atmospheres of some of these exoplanets that are far away, we would instantly be able to, we would instantly have very, very strong evidence that there was life there on these systems without actually physically contacting them or reaching them or visiting them. We'd be able to determine there was very, very, there's a very good chance that there's life in these systems. And so this seems like the best alternative because we don't have to send a signal and hope that maybe it comes back or spend 350,000 years going down there. We can just simply observe and see if we see these chemicals. And so how does this actually work? So it turns out that we don't need any new technology from what I've already explained to you. We can use the transit method still to determine the atmospheres of these exoplanets. One small change I want to add to this is, so before I told you that if we were alien astronomers and we were looking at the sun, we would notice a constant amount of brightness over time. Let me just caveat that with, we would detect a constant amount of brightness at each color. And so, if we were detecting a constant amount of brightness at each color, as the planet passes in front of the star, the planet itself would block all the light that's incident upon it. But this is not necessarily the case for the atmosphere. It turns out that the atmosphere would allow most colors to pass through, but it would block some very, very specific colors. And the, very, the specificness of these colors would correspond to the chemicals that are present in these atmospheres. And so, for instance, if we were to look at this spectrum, which is essentially a color diagram showing the amount of light in each color, if we were looking at this diagram and you see that there are these lines here, these absences of color, then we'd be able to determine that there are certain chemicals present in these atmospheres. And so, for instance, if there was hydrogen and helium in this atmosphere, then every time this specific color passed through the atmosphere, it would be blocked by the atmosphere. And as a result, so if here on Earth we were detecting these atmospheres and we saw that we were detecting all these colors, but there's no light right here, and no light right here, and no light right here, we'd be able to determine there's hydrogen and helium present in these atmospheres. <clears throat> and so, what's the timeline for something like this? How soon do we have to wait to determine if there's life elsewhere in the universe using exoplanet atmospheres as the next step? It turns out that we're not quite there with the technology for Earth-sized planets. Currently, we can detect Jupiter-sized planet atmospheres, and we can detect Neptune-sized planet atmospheres, but we're not quite there yet with Earth-sized atmospheres. But the technology is coming, and within our lifetime, we should expect to see the technology present to detect atmospheres of Earth-sized planets. And when that day comes, all we have to do is just scan the sky and just one after one, one by one, slowly go through the most likely habitable candidates. And if we should ever detect hydrogen, or sorry, oxygen and ozone in these atmospheres, then that'd be very, very conducive for life. And it'd be a very, very exciting discovery. So as I start to conclude this talk, I would like to raise the question that humans have been thinking about for as long as they've stared up at the nice sky. Are we alone? Is there life elsewhere in the universe? It turns out that the answer to this question 
depends on two very opposing factors. On the one hand, we have found out through this lecture, throughout this lecture that it is incredibly hard to, or it, it requires very, very specific prerequisites for life to develop. It has to be Earth-sized, it has to be in a habitable zone, it needs a substantial atmosphere, but not too substantial of an atmosphere. It needs to have the right chemicals, it needs to have liquid water, it needs to have plate tectonics. There's a whole slew of requirements that scientists deem have been very crucial and important for life here to develop. On the other hand, however, we are discovering for the very first time that habitable planets, at least the basic properties, we're not yet sure of atmospheres and plate tectonics and you know, moisture and water and all these things, but the basic properties, it's in the habitable zone and it's Earth size. We're discovering that this is in fact very, very common. And so as a result, you know, when we consider it's extremely rare for life to exist, and on the other hand, in our galaxy alone, there are about 22 billion Earth-like planets in the habitable zone, or habitable planets. It seems like we're not really qualified yet as humans to be able to, to answer this question. We need a little bit more information. And so we'll have to wait for the exact answer to this question. But it seems like, regardless of what this answer is, whether or not it's yes or no, it seems like both answers are equally as exhilarating. On the one hand, let's suppose that there is life in the universe. Then, even though we ourselves may never meet them, humanity, as long as humanity survives, humanity will eventually meet these aliens. And think about all we could learn about them and about ourselves if we met them. Think of all the histories we could exchange. Think of all the science and technology and religions and philosophies we could exchange. Not to mention all we could learn about ourselves. I mean, do these aliens, do they like music? Do they like to dance? Do they participate in war? Are they capable of love? All these emotions, all these things. And who knows if you know, this is a unique thing of life here on Earth or if this is widespread. So if we met aliens, we could determine a lot. We could learn so much. On the other hand, let's suppose that there is no life in the universe and we are completely alone. Then, this would, be, this would be a reminder of just how special and how unique we are here as human beings on Earth. You know, a, a comparison that one can make is if we represented Earth as a single grain of sand and we compared this grain of sand to all the grains of sand on all the beaches on Earth, then that's the kind of reality we are facing. It's a tough comparison to make and visualize, but that would be the reality that we are facing. Because if we are truly alone in the universe, then we'd, be, we'd all be winners of the greatest lottery ever conceived. For out of all the planets and all the dust and all the gas in the universe, we are the favorite few atoms who get to participate in this thing called life. So I would like to close this talk with uh, one of my favorite pieces of media, the introduction to the movie Contact. And so I think no better movie or introduction shows the perspective of just where we sit in the universe and, and how we fit. And when you're watching this video, I would like for you to think about all we've learned in this talk. That you know, even as of two weeks ago, we are now learning for the very first time that you know, habitable planets are very, very common and very, very widespread. And, you know, no generation before us has been as close to that answer, is there life in the universe, as we are right now here today. I'd also like you to take note of the 70 light year sphere radius, or 70 light year radius sphere that is present in this video. You'll hear some audio which will slowly fade away as the, the movie goes on. And without further ado, here's the movie.
All right, that's it. Do you guys have any questions? Uh, so it is, it's, it's called what we, it's what scientists call a candidate, which means that um, we've discovered its existence, but there's still a few more tests that we need to run to officially confirm that it is indeed a planet. Um, but it, it's not a habitable planet, unless I'm mistaken. But it is, yeah, it is a planet. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yep. Uh, I've heard of the field called astrobiology, and it's a lot of times shown in popular science like on TV, magazines, and all that, where people, astrobiologists, Sort of, uh, I guess best word would be estimate, but the physical form of macroscopic life would be on other planets. But based on what we know about what life can be on Earth, how much could we know about what the physical form of an alien on another planet would be like? Right. So uh, maybe one thing that you've encountered uh, is the Drake equation, which kind of talks about the likelihood or the number of alien species on other planets. And so we're slowly, I mean, all these are really just best estimates. The, the real truth and heart, heart of the matter is, is we just don't know. As far as we, we can conclusively tell you is essentially what I've displayed here today. I mean, there are all these models and all these different um, simulations that one can show uh, and suggest the possibilities of life. But as far as any confirmed um, existence of life in another form, we don't really have any ideas yet. Any conclusive ideas? We can't tell for sure. We can't tell for sure, but we have a lot of ideas. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. When you were showing the animation of the um, the brightness uh, for the, the transit method, I noticed that there was a really big dip when the planet transits in front of the star. There's also a secondary dip when it goes behind the star. It's a lot smaller. Now. Yes. That? Right. I will take you to that. It's a good question. <laughs> Sharp eye. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So it turns out as the planet is getting ready to pass in front of the sun, it turns out you can see if you, if you look really closely at the planet right here, it's dark. And then light will reflect off the planet and then back towards us. 
And so as a result, there's an additional component of brightness. You can see here that it's like, here's the flat line, and it slowly raises in brightness right before it transits because there's light reflecting off that planet and towards us. So there's an additional component of, life, of light reaching us. And then when it passes in front of the, behind the star, it's gone. And so as a result, you get that, that, deep, that dip. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yes. Uh, I understand that one of the ways the SETI programs narrows down the odds that they might find alien life is to look for evidence of technology. Yes. So how could you, is there any method to look at these, the Kepler and Gleese and point something at it to say, OK, do you have any evidence of technology past or present? Yes. So, so that is. I would say that that is another alternative that we could use to determine if there's life elsewhere instead of looking for presence of oxygen and ozone, et cetera. Um, but for instance, um, the bandwidth. So currently, the SETI program is still in existence in some small amount. Um, but the total bandwidth for possible ranges, frequency ranges, where they could send us radio signals is so vast that they could, like for instance, they could be sending us radio signals right now, this very moment. And we are just not listening at the right frequency. It would not hear it. Just not to mention, you know, the SETI program has been existing for what, like, 25 years, 30 years, maybe. And when you put that on the time scale of how long Earth has been existing for, you know, four billion years, that's an incredibly small amount of time scale. To you know, we we would have had to have been extremely lucky to have detected a signal in just the amount of the small amount of time that SETI has been in existence. So that is definitely an option. We could look for signals and look for technology or some sign of technology. But it seems like that question or the answer of where we would start looking is so broad and so vast that it seems hard to really narrow down that search. But is there any way to specifically point to knowing that we have those two planets that are the right size? Do we have any equipment that we can start? Yep, yeah. That, 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 being a bit of it too there? That is true. We could do that. And as far as I know, there's, there's no reason why we can't, but we're not doing it right now. I think we're just generally scanning the sky, but that is actually probably a good idea. We might as well be pointing at these habitable planets just in case. That's an interesting point, yeah. Yeah? Uh, referring to the current uh, animation, um, you will have both transmissive and reflective spectra from the atmosphere uh, being possible uh, sources of uh, detection. Uh, what would it take to detect uh, what sort of telescope do you need to actually detect uh, uh, Earth-sized uh, uh, atmospheres? atmospheres. Yeah, atmospheres. Um, so the uh, basically the 30-meter uh, telescope TMT is a telescope currently in, in development uh, right now. It should, it, it, as the name suggests, it's about 30 meters in diameter, and so that would be a significant telescope, large enough to be able to detect. Uh, atmospheres of Earth-sized planets. It's not currently finished yet, and probably won't be finished for another couple years. But uh, the technology is basically the problem comes down to you need to collect enough photons. So either you can uh, you can detect many transits one after the other, and after you know 500 of them, eventually we'd have enough total photons that we could determine uh, the properties of the atmosphere. Or you get a really large telescope and you observe less transits to get that total number of photons or total collection of light. Uh, and so uh, right now, you know, the Kepler Space Telescope was only in operation for four years and then it broke. Uh, and so as a result, it wasn't long enough to be able to detect these atmospheres because didn't, we didn't quite have the precision, precision yet. Um, but yeah, uh, the, thir the 30 meter telescope, TMT, would, be, would do the job. Uh, it would probably be easier to detect the uh, simply detect the absorptive properties uh, instead of the emissive, just because you'd be competing with the emission properties of the star itself, uh, and the star is just overwhelmingly bright. So uh, my best bet would be with the absorptive properties. Yeah. Yep. Uh, does the color of the planet have an effect on the transit method? Uh, the color of the planet has no. Uh, bearing on the detection method that you use, it turns out that all that is required for the transit, for instance, is just the right orientation. Um, but the s specific nature of the planet itself, or the color, um, does not have any significant bearing. No. Uh, yeah. Is there any consideration given in, in what's extracted from uh, the discovery to elliptical orbits or elliptical orbits that would take it into and out of the habitable zone? Uh, that's a very interesting question, actually. Um, currently, we actually Due to the transit method, one thing I didn't mention, but that you're absolutely right, is we don't actually know 
too much about the elliptical properties of these planets. Um, it turns out if we could actually detect uh, the transit and the secondary transit, um, we would be able to determine the eccentricity using the transit method. But uh, currently, we know very, very few planets where we can detect the secondary transit as well. Um, so the eccentricity is very much unconstrained. But in general, if there was a planet that was very eccentric, it would definitely, uh, it would definitely uh, affect the habitability of that planet. Absolutely. Yep. Just wondering, um, how would you separate the planet's uh, atmospheric spectrum from the stars? Because from here, of course, they're very, they'd be very, very close. So, yes. Um, as you said, it would be kind of oh, the star would be kind of overwhelming the planet. So, how would you actually separate the, the atmosphere? How would you know it's the atmosphere of the planet, and not something from the star? Right. So, so the first thing we would do is, first of all, we would be detecting if we just detect the star itself before the transit has actually taken place, we can see exactly what the spectra is of the star. Uh, and then once the transit is, once the planet is in front of the star, we can notice the difference. If there's any change in the spectra, even if it was very, very minute, if there's any change in the spectra as the planet passes in front of the star, but then once, if the planet, once the planet has done the transit, if those properties disappeared, then we'd be able to conclude that those properties that suddenly appeared and then disappeared were likely due to the transit. And an additional property is we always usually look, uh, or, or in the infrared, it's the, uh, the discrepancy between the brightness of the star and the brightness of the planet is much less severe. Whereas in the optical, it's just the star is just overwhelmingly bright. So th that's how we would do it. Yep. Uh, why do the houses of uh, understanding which zone can the planets be in? Uh, is there an assumption that dark matter is not included or dark matter is not present in those systems? So dark matter is more applicable to the large scale structures of, um, of the universe uh, and of galaxies and stuff. Uh, currently, well, for starters, currently there are many hypotheses for what uh, dark matter is, but we don't conclusively know. So um, for instance, one hypothesis, although I think it's actually been ruled out now, is that dark matter could sim simply be you know, planets and uh, Jupiters and, and uh, hot Jupiters and uh, Jovian planets, where it's just simply non-luminous matter, like, like rocks and like we would be dark matter, essentially. So uh, I don't think that, I think that theory has been ruled out. But in any case, um, that wouldn't really apply necessarily to, to systems themselves. Uh, yeah, so we are making an assumption that there's no dark matter, but as far as I'm aware of, it's a pretty good assumption. We have time for two more questions. Yep. What are some of the, uh, you mentioned uh, very briefly at the beginning some of the uh, pre uh, one of the prerequisites for uh, uh, for life. What are some of the uh, what are some of the considerations that that might be unique that we have to be looking for? For example, uh, for, uh, the origin of water on Earth. We assume that that uh, that it came from late bombardment period, and for that we would need uh, we need uh, Jupiter and Saturn to be pulling on an Oort cloud. Right. So there is you know <coughs> infinite precision that one can try and tackle these questions. Um, you know. How did water get there? Because you're right, you know, the formation process, you know, if this, if this is a, a habitable planet by our standards, it's Earth-sized and in the habitable zone, but if there's no Jupiter-sized planet also accompanying it, then perhaps it wouldn't get the same bombardment that Earth would get and we wouldn't get the same water uh, deposition that we have here on Earth. It's true that there are still details that we need to work out. And um, as far as that question goes, I don't really have a great answer for you, I would say, because in general, I would say, scientists don't really know, you know, how we'd be able to tell, oh, there is conclusively water on that planet unless we detected it in the atmosphere. So I think the next step, when we can finally detect atmospheres of Earth-sized planets, then a whole wealth of information will develop. Even if we don't necessarily detect ozone and oxygen in these atmospheres, we'll still be able to detect perhaps water or all these other chemicals, you know, nitrogen maybe, that are very important uh, for habitability in that sense. Because that, that, that's another question. Just because a planet is habitable doesn't guarantee that life will develop there. Other than tides, what, what has been the impact of the moon for us? Um, that is somewhat of an uncertain question. Um, I mean, people have uh, thought that it has a lot to do with uh, stability as well. Um, and maybe sometimes uh, 
because it's kind of a two-body system, then maybe uh, you can have this, these exchanges of angular momentum. And sometimes, let's say if there was another uh, impact, let's say the, the asteroid that killed the dinosaurs, then perhaps that could act as a stabilizing mechanism. But um, again, as far as a good answer for you, I don't, I'm not positive. Was there any impact of the moon to thin out our atmosphere compared to Venus not having a moon? Uh, no, I don't think that the moon played a significant role in the thickness of our atmosphere. I think that was more so that it had a runaway greenhouse effect, which is actually, um, you know, all this talk about global warming on Earth. It's, it's potentially something that could happen to us millions of years from now or thousands of years from now. Um, if we continued our increase in CO2, then uh, that's, that's what's believed that happened. Once you reach a threshold, then it's just a positive feedback loop and you get more and more CO2 and then nothing can stop it. Uh, so that has more to do with uh, the, the heaviness of the planet itself. Mars is physically too light. As I talked about earlier, all these chemicals that had started there have all drifted away by now. But we have, but Earth is heavier than Venus. Yeah, we could continue this conversation after. Okay. Okay. Yeah. <coughs> yep. What kind of light do you think would have to be discovered to um, rise above the general chatter of pop culture? That is a very you know, interesting question. Yeah, I mean, because I mean, let's say aliens showed up tomorrow, you know, there'd be a significant population that would just want to point all the guns at the sky. <laughs> so, I mean, the type of alien that would have to show up that would kind of make people suddenly snap out of perhaps the pop culture that you're talking about. I'm not sure what they would have to do or if they would even be aware that such a thing as pop culture even exists. I mean, they wouldn't even know what kind of entrance they would have to make to kind of remedy that kind of situation. So. <laughs> I see. Um, so vegetation and leaves and stuff would, would be very, very specific detail that we probably wouldn't be able to detect just yet. Um, but I think, for instance, um, ozone and oxygen, which I talked about earlier, would be very, very strong indicators that there is actually life on another planet. Yeah. We could uh, thank Ari again.